And welcome to another edition of Daily Drinkers Podcast. As always, my name is Rocky. Tonight, I am drinking, let's get the logo here, Guinness Drought, the black bottle with a wrap around it. Mm-mm, good. Uh, and uh, as always, I'm Marbles. Um, I'm also drinking a Guinness, except I am drinking the Nitro Cold Brew Coffee. Mmm. Mmm. Coffee. Guinness and night. coffee. Ah, at 7 o'clock. Guinness coffee and some Baileys, and we got ourselves a morning in Vegas right there. Mm-hmm. I'm actually wondering if I... if this is good in the morning... But that would make me an alcoholic, right? <laughs> Sir, you're only an alcoholic if you stop drinking. If you continue to drink, you're functioning. Mm. You're a functioning alcoholic. That makes sense. Alcoholics quit. If you don't quit, you're not alcoholic. <laughs> so what's new this week? Um, got into a fight at work. Going to get a new car. My dad is suspiciously up to something. Don't know, but I know it's up to no good. So I've avoided his calls. Mm, Nobody really knows what's going on with my grandfather. My dad won't release any of that information, but he sold his house. So Okay. I'm surprised he managed to do that, given the whole... He the... was listed for five hours, got <laughs> six offers, and they got 60000 over market value. Well, I, 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 I know that houses are going quick and people are paying extra money for them, but I'm surprised he was able to sell it because from what I remember, he wasn't oh, he, like is. able to sell it technically. It's a whole lot of <laughs> what? So I'm surprised he actually so managed to sell IRS it. IRS or EDD or uh, any legal entity out there. Be very suspicious of a house that just sold on Meadow Green Lane in La Mirada. Mm. Yeah, oh, um, I'll make sure all of the um, the government agencies that listen to this show uh, open up the file cabinets. All we got to do is start talking about Kennedy and aliens. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, see, that's that's the that's the red herring. Is that there's so many people that talk about it that they're not even interested anymore. What about the bombs? <laughs> Bin Laden? I don't know. What are the trigger words nowadays? What are the NSA trigger words? Um, I don't know. Snowden, can you help us out? Just take over my computer. And let me know what the trigger words are. I hope I hope I'm, I hope YouTube lets me upload this episode because <laughs> it does do checks. I don't know what it checks. But it runs through a thing. It's like, yeah, we're checking this video. It'll uh-huh. upload when we're done. Hopefully, I just hit every trigger. Right so there. hopefully, hopefully, it lets me upload this. If not, then we'll have to record another tomorrow, <laughs> or I have to go in and edit out this whole uh, like five minutes. Eh. Yeah, I'm sure I'll yeah. hit some more triggers along the way. Um. No, that's nuts. I'm surprised he was. It. Did he have to split the money with um, any other family? I have or what? How, no how, idea what's going on with that. How right did now. that not like explode? Because I can only imagine so, the rest of the family would have been cool with him pocketing all of that plus the sixty grand on top. <laughs> so, how I see it going down, I figure Grandpa's house is probably the loan he had on it about three hundred thousand, give or take maybe 400,000, but he also had a reverse mortgage on it. So I don't really know how much of that was principal or whatnot. Yeah. They sold the house for 890. Jesus. And I know my dad pitched it to my aunt as, Hey, grandpa needs healthcare. His monthly bill for the hospice home is $9,000 a month. Rough estimate. Okay, yeah. Once again, I don't I don't know hard numbers because nobody knows where he's at. But he's like on social security, right? So I'm sure social security pays for part of hospice. So the way that it works is depending on his level of care, 
they will give X amount of dollars for what is needed. Mm. If you want him to go to a specific facility, you have to pay the difference. Okay. So rough estimate, maybe if they deemed it all the way that needed to get deemed, they would pay maybe four grand. Maybe if they're lucky. Maybe half. So okay. Still five thousand out of pocket. A month that the family Which would have to come up with. Doesn't make sense because my grandpa's a veteran and the VA has those homes for free. Or if not, the VA will help cover the cost of said items. They would cover. I, I'm going super casual today. That's why my knee's just up, and I'm just like, yeah. That's Drop that's me, fine. Like, your French boys. Rocky just free balling. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. No. Well, knowing knowing your dad, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, none of that money from the house goes to his care. One hundred percent. It just mysteriously goes to some bills that the rest of the family are just vaguely unaware of. But the story that he tells everyone is, oh, no, it's going to the care. And who's it's going to pay for him. Yeah. So I don't even know. It's a cluster and a half. I, I, I just don't I just don't months. know how how he sells it without like paying taxes. <laughs> Like okay, wait, the IRS just... is already after him. Yeah, the fact that they're already after him for taxes. What what I don't get is, like, is he technically the seller? Like, is his, is he named on it or not? Because if he's not, then I can see how like, um, he actually not, like the I because because when you sell a house, you pay taxes. Um, so so the way I think it's set up is Grandpa had a trust. My dad is the executor of the trust. So if the house gets sold, the money goes to the trust, non taxes, because it's a trust at the moment. Yeah. But but it's under your grandfather's name, so therefore the IRS would look and, at him, not and, your dad. Yes. And since there's still legalities around the whole thing, supposedly there's a power of attorney nobody knows about, nobody's seen. It's I I couldn't even begin to describe the letter of what the, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that's why he's calling you. <laughs> I think pretty sure he wants. Uh, so how can I? Because uh, he wants taxes on all this. Yeah, he wants he wants to put things in your name, and then you give him the money. <laughs> yeah, he put it in my name. I'll never see it again. <laughs> hey, Dad! Thanks for the new car. Here, uh, put this in your name. I need you to file this with the IRS and then give me the rest. <laughs> Except when he does that, it's considered an inheritance, and then I don't have to pay the inheritance tax up to a certain amount of money. Yeah, true. <laughs> I'm already ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 fair. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. If he sends me five thousand dollars every couple weeks or every week, then yeah. I can deposit five thousand dollars weekly. Yeah, it just—I uh, don't know. When you always tell me, "Oh, he's calling out of the blue," I always think, "Well, something's up. <laughs> he's he's got he's got but... something up his sleeve. There's no reason why he just calls out of the blue." Just to uh, say, "Hey, I miss you." No, yeah, you're not my father. <laughs> you're an alien. Hey, I miss you. I just wanted to talk to you. No, no ulterior Are motives. There... By the way, how can I get rid of sixty thousand dollars really quick? <laughs> um, or I'll get a, get a random. So when's that new electric Volkswagen bus coming out? I don't even know that answer. <laughs> Volkswagen doesn't have that answer. <laughs> they don't know. Um, well, that's like that's like uh, I always for when I started working at my job, someone had brought up that. Yeah, there was a there was a concept page for the Santa Cruz, which is like Hyundai's truck. Yeah. And um, I remember that concept page. That was put up before I started working there, like almost six years ago. <laughs> and they're barely coming out with it now. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, they probably don't know when it'll come out. Just it looks like a Honda Ridgeline. Supposedly, it was coming out next year. Yeah, it's the it's I think 2022 model is when it it's supposed to be. Um, 
But for 45000 I don't know if they're going to hit the truck market running. I don't know. Um, it's just, I just know that was like, it was on the website as a concept thing for freaking ever. So I don't know. I don't know if right now is a good time to try to jump in the truck market when there's already a shortage of cars and trucks because there's a chip shortage. And even if it's for like next year, let's say, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how much is going to be sold. So Ford released their Maverick prototype. They already have 40,000 reservations for that truck. That's not even out yet. Well, yeah, no reservations is like the big thing to do now for car companies. And I think it's, I'd want to say, I'd want to blame Tesla for it because they were doing it years ago where you could put like a hundred dollars down on a car that is still in the factory being made mm-hmm. and like hasn't even come out yet. And you're going to wait six months to a year for it to like roll out, but you can already put money down and that money it's goes to order paying. A video game. Yeah. It's the same concept. And so car manufacturers, for some reason, everyone else at the same time all realize like, Hey, let's all start doing that. <laughs> Let's all start doing reservations on our websites. And then so we can start selling cars before they're made. Um, nothing can go wrong with that. Nothing can go wrong with that. Uh, not look, you know, definitely not looking at Tesla and how many people backed out of their pre-orders when they realized that the car was going to take two years. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and with there being a shortage, like I can't see them getting back up to speed or fulfilling all those orders. Like, in a normal timeline. I feel like everything's going to get pushed out. So you're going to well, see a lot of everything... people who get one of their money back because they don't want to wait that long. If everything goes the way that they have planned, we will be a year and a half out before car dealerships get back to normal. That's Which what means I'm thinking. Over the next two years, used car parts or used car prices are going to go through the roof. Right now, there's certain model Chevys that are going for higher than brand new cost when the car came out. Yeah. Yeah, because there's just a shortage of cars. And if you have... And demand's not going down. Any decent truck in the South that's got decent mileage, they'll basically pay you five grand over what you owe on that vehicle just to get you out of it. That's insane. The world is I mean, I guess, I guess there's a demand. I mean, yeah, I guess the demand of people needing or wanting cars is not going down. No. Um. Just supplies down. And that's going to drive up demand even higher. What are all the things that contributed to the supply going down? So a good portion of it was COVID just shutting down factories in general. So yeah, manufacturing went down. And then you had everything across the board, mining companies, stuff like that. You can't have a full-blown mining operation going on when you have COVID spread around. You have your precautions. Granted, in third world countries, they didn't care. But yeah. then you have the Suez Canal blockage, which set everything back. So then the places that were expecting stuff were two months behind. Yeah, And then you had some of the other big players that switched from car manufacturing to equipment and health supplies to support that so you're right kind of have a hodgepodge of everything to where every department went in five different directions and then basically the health field took over whatever was left on the market because that was most important yeah yeah i guess there's just a ripple effect across different industries because now there's i mean there was always like for like computer parts, computer stuff has been certain parts have been hard to come by, um, which is also affecting because a lot of the same manufacturing places that make computer parts, make car parts or make other electronic parts, especially like semiconductors and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that industry works is you a lot like you buy basically manufacturing time. So yep. you buy so many 
weeks or whatever of manufacturing, make all your parts, and then some other company comes in and takes, you know, starts up manufacturing after you to make their stuff. And then you're kind of just sharing these resources, um, which is why, like, if if companies need to make more, they have to wait for uh, free time in the in the factory slot. It's kind of like booking reservations. Mm-hmm. If there's no open reservations, then you have to wait. And if there's no food put on the table, nobody's making reservations. Yep. So I don't know. I with the whole thing where they're trying to increase um, semiconductor production in the U.S. because we don't really do that here. It's all a lot of it's done in Taiwan. I heard like Taiwanese companies are starting up are going to be starting up like branches in the U.S. to make semiconductors. Well, which puts uh, Taiwan in another precarious position with like China. <laughs> well, that's already started with uh, China, Japan, and the U.S. all basically having a standoff over Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And China's like, yeah, we're going to go in there and we're just going to take it. And the U.S. said, no, you're not. Even Japan said, said yeah. no, you're not. What are you going to do with that, that? And then Japan said, hey, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not even supposed to be voting on this, but because you said no to the U.S., we have a clause in our constitution that allows us to vote. So if you go after them, you go after us. Yeah, the, it's the, they basically reinterpreted their constitution so that way they could come to the defense of their allies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and technically, have... they're not starting a war. We're just because that's illegal. We'll just join one <laughs> if it's already started. That's uh, not that illegal. Right. Let's put that side. Oh, then you have Europe saying "ha ha ha," no, you're not, and then you get Russia saying "ha ha ha," I want in on this too. Yeah, so everyone wants in on it. it Taiwan's going to be the next Vietnam, but for like global warfare or internet warfare, if that makes sense. Yeah, the next... whoever controls Taiwan controls the tech industry. Yeah, a large chunk of it. Yeah, and hence why another portion of this video will not make it to YouTube. Yeah, T- talking about uh, um. East East Asian uh, politics and <laughs> GDPs. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to get everything triggered so they can read this video or watch it. Read it too. Read I don't it. care. <laughs> read it as a transcript. Um, Put the closed captioning on. Get it in the hands of somebody. I think I can upload captions, but I'm not typing this out. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like YouTube auto caption it if they want. Um. Yeah. Oh, that'd be really interesting if they actually like censor it. censor it. <laughs> like, do you think they censor certain words? <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll find out. I don't know. I was yeah, I was reading an article about because it was like the anniversary for the 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 Chinese like Communist Party's. Um, I don't know if it's founding or or what. Um, and then it was going on about how like Taiwan is trying to. No one, no, no major country wants to acknowledge that, like, Taiwan, like they're their own country. Yeah. Um. Everyone kind of, like, treats them like that, but unofficially. Um. Because it, it all comes down to like having trade and all this, these other perks and and stuff of keeping things the way they are, status quo, and how like you know, <laughs> yeah, China could just invade and try to take it but then the u.s would get involved which means japan would probably get involved because they have an interest in keeping china from taking it um it wouldn't surprise me if like south korea or even some of the other southeast asian countries get involved because china has been encroaching on their territorial waters too building those islands out there um so there's a lot of other countries that aren't happy about that so it's it just seems like there's really no it's not like when Russia took um the, Ukraine. the Crimea the Crimea like that that huge chunk of Ukraine that big chunk of land nobody like besides Ukraine really contested it like nobody 
They just kind of let Russia just take it. It's like we're in the 21st century and a country just goes into another country's land and just claims something. It's like they don't oh, do that man. anymore. Yeah, and no one did anything about it. But I feel like maybe that part, uh, like the Crimea, wasn't extremely valuable to the other, you know, first world countries, you know, Western Europe or the U.S. or, you know, Canada or any or anything. And that's why they let it happen. But I feel like Taiwan, since Taiwan makes so much like products for the rest mm-hmm. of the world, I feel like they have a vested interest in keeping things out of mm-hmm. China's hands. So I feel like that's a different scenario where they aren't going to just walk in one day and take it because the rest of the world's like, no, 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 no. It's, mm-hmm. We own some of that. <laughs> like, hey, like uh, we, we bought some of this. We paid for some of it. Thanks for coming to visit, but GTFO, but you need, bro. Yeah, you need to leave. Um, You've overstayed your welcome. And, that and doesn't, my that, friend here. That doesn't help anybody in, in that situation. Everyone kind of loses. Like... You could get some, like, political points back home or whatever by doing that. But it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like when Argentina invaded the Falcons in the early 80s. (laughs) And they're like, hey, yeah, this is our land and we're just going to come and take it. And they did. And then Great Britain sent, like, an aircraft carrier over and, like, kicked the shit out of them. And then pushed them back out and says, no, they're English. (laughs) And (laughs) and everyone just kind of went like, well, you know, that's what happened. Like, you should (laughs) have expected that. Like. They weren't going to let you just take that (laughs) just so that way back home in Argentina, you can get some, you know, like brownie points for taking back some um, historical, you know, uh, piece of land that used to be yours. Like they don't they're they're just going to go take it back. Like it's not it's not really a win for anybody. Um, So, yeah. On a side note. I did learn over the weekend that thanks to Great Britain, there are 64 different Independence Days that get celebrated across the world. Yeah. Yeah. There might be All more soon. Who knows? One... <laughs> All thanks to one, one colonial country. <laughs> one island. One island. Members. Hey, they, they, that, as the saying used to go, like, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Because it literally didn't. <laughs> they owned so much of the world at one point that you could be wherever the sun shined. There's some you can claim that you were in the British Empire. Yes, yes, I'm in the British Empire. Um, no, there's. I mean, even like Scotland's talking about like um, doing another referendum to like declare independence. There's that whole issue with Northern Ireland that's. Who knows what they're going to end up doing. A bunch of them want to stay. A bunch of them don't. Like, uh, um, I think there's more luck in getting Scotland to uh, to secede than Northern Ireland at this point. But Especially with Brexit going on. I mean, that's kind of what screwed them. Like, Scotland, if you look at the, the map of the way they voted... Like all of Scotland, Scotland voted to stay because it just benefited them economically and, mm-hmm. you know, commercially um, to have like open free trade to allow people to travel around, get jobs in other countries. And, and it just made things a lot easier. Um, and then certain parts of England were like, no, we're, we're going to leave because we want to keep the immigrants out. And then it's like, well, you kind of need them to do jobs. So now you just kind of screw yourself. Make the world go round. I mean, everyone's like, even here in the U.S., people harp on like, oh, we don't want immigrants. And it's like, yeah, but um, our birth rate's not high enough to sustain like the industries that we do have. <laughs> the once the baby boomers all like retire or die off. Um, millennials are the are the biggest generation currently, um, but it's like avocado goes for everyone. Yeah, but it's like you're 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 gonna hit a balance where there's gonna be more like retired people than people working, mm-hmm. and less people being born, which means in the next twenty years your your uh, workforce is gonna be a lot smaller. 
than it is now. The fact that they keep moving everything out of the states too. Yeah, that doesn't help either. The workforce. So it's like, yeah, you do need immigration to keep the population at a point where it can produce at the same level or greater and also supply enough income for people who are retired. Social Security. I mean, a lot of people don't understand how Social Security works. Like, yeah, when you work, you 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 pay Social Security, but that money isn't getting saved for you. That money is going to someone who is on Social Security. And then the yeah. and then the government basically writes an IOU for when you retire. Like, okay, this is how much we'll owe you in forty years or fifty years. Um, but that money that you currently put into Social Security on your paycheck, yeah, that's going to your neighbor down the street who's retired. Like that's what's paying his Social Security. Mm -hmm. So if we lose workers, then uh, we have no Social Security. <laughs> But it's the similar thing in like in in the UK when they're like, oh, we want, you know, Brexit. It's like, yeah, but you kind of need the immigrants to work to keep your systems going, like to pay for things. So. All they have to do is play Civ Rev once and they'll understand all of this. Yeah. The yeah, man people, they don't understand basic economics. <laughs> Not that hard, people. It's not that hard. So, they have so many video games about this. They have video games about it. They have documentaries about it. They have. There's. It's not. It's not that hard. Money goes in and money goes out. Money goes in should be higher than money goes out. If it's reversed, okay. you have a problem. Somehow they managed to figure out how to borrow against it, put it negative, and then say, "Nope, sorry, it's your fault." Yeah. That's another dumb thing is is like when they borrowed against Social Security or or when they like to lower taxes on the rich. I actually saw something on I think Instagram. Is this old guy explaining how trickle down economics don't work? He's like, if you have a company that makes, um, I think he's, I think you use like screen doors. You have a company that makes screen doors, okay? And let's say they make. 200 screen doors a month all right well trickle down economics like advocates will say well if you give if you give the company a tax break that means they'll have more capital and therefore they'll be able to hire more people and create more jobs the reality is the company makes 200 screen doors a month you gave them a tax break but their demand for screen doors don't go up. So why would they hire more people? They're just going to keep making 200 screen doors a month with the employees that they have. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to pocket the rest. <laughs> That's just profit now. Why, why would they hire more people? They don't need to. But if you give the workers a tax break, they will spend more money on their families, on trips, on whatever. By spending more money means they increase demand for things. Increasing demand is how you increase profit. You have more people that need screen doors, yeah. so therefore you're making more screen therefore doors. Therefore you make more screen doors. So not only do you hire more people, but you also produce more to meet the higher demand. So it's actually a bigger benefit to give the workers, the, the people who spend the most money, um, give them a tax break because they're more likely to spend more than the ones who have a lot of money because they're not likely to spend more money the reason why they have money is because they don't spend it's because they don't spend money and another thing too it's like what what business what business person do you can you think of that takes their their tax break and uses their own money to fund a, an enterprise who uses their own money they never do nobody does they, they get investors. They borrow it. They get loans out. They borrow from the bank. No one uses their own money to like... Jeff Bezos doesn't use his own money to, to build an Amazon warehouse. Please. Like he uses his own money for that. He tells all of his investors, I got a great idea. I can make a lot more money, but I need you to build me a warehouse. Yeah, that's how it works. So, so, so why is he not paying taxes? Oh, did you hear about the petition? Um, for global uh, corporation tax? 
Uh, no. Well, there's there's that where they all want to agree on the same tax tax amounts. But no, there's a petition to not let Jeff Bezos come back to Earth when he goes into space like next month. <laughs> He's supposed well, to go into uh... space on on like his Blue Origin rocket, some test thing, and people sign, are signing this petition to deny not him reentry. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't, I don't think you can stop that. <laughs> well, there's the, he's mad because Richard Branson is basically going to beat him by a week. Yeah. Which is, which is funny when you see billionaires like that stick it to each other on like <laughs> an uncalculable scale. Like the amount of money they spent just to, just to beat another billionaire by a week to get into space. It's it's like ridiculous. It's like uh do you remember um the trading spaces with Dan Aykroyd trading places? Trading space trading places. Trading places. Yeah, with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. And at the very end of the movie, uh you find out that the two rich guys were betting a dollar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were in the bathroom and he like hands the guy a dollar. It's like that's what they were betting these two men's lives on. <laughs> a single dollar. Yeah, it's a joke. Um, what a great world we live in. Which which one do you have your money on that's gonna like not make it back? <laughs> They'll both make it back. Cause and then I got an idea that Musk is just gonna do something crazy and outlandish to put them both to shame. Well, he's he's gonna um, he's gonna. They're pre- I don't know if they're going to test this one or if they're just testing the rockets on this one, but they're pre- putting together the super heavy like booster that's like as tall as the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> so, okay, you know that rocket that, that he's testing in um down there in, in like in uh, Texas? Was it Boca Chica or something? Yeah. The one that flies up and then it like flops onto its belly and like free falls back to Earth. Yeah. Okay, he's going to put that on top of the booster. <laughs> and that's and that's that's what's going to send people to Mars. <laughs> so, I it's just like shooting a skyscraper in space. After uh, Bezos and Branson come back, Musk is just going to say, "YOLO, going to the moon, guys. Yeah. See you later." And then he's gone. And he's just going to he's just going to peace out. And SpaceX. Was it that Japanese billionaire that paid uh, for a trip to the moon on like Musk's rocket or something? Yeah. So him oh and that God. him and that that billionaire, uh, other like super rich guy, are gonna like drink champagne on the moon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he's gonna come back and be like, "Yo, this just got me to the moon, but it's in all my Tesla Model Xs right now." Yeah. <laughs> And then it's just going to through the roof. It's got, it's got the bulletproof glass that's on the uh, Cybertruck. Um, no, but uh, what's it called? Bezos or Branson, I don't think, have actually successfully launched anything into space. No. Which is why them going into space is, like, risky as hell. But they're not going on their own product. Yeah, they are. Aren't they going on their own their own ships no that's the point of this no i gotta look this up now i i have to look it up too uh bezos choose july 20th uh, da, 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 da. um Yeah, so Branson's company announced so Thursday. Branson's going in Virgin Galactic. So yeah, yeah, so it's his space spacecraft. Um, I mean, considering they're already in the aerospace field, I don't think that's too yeah, far but of a not as much. But they still haven't successfully gotten anything into actual like yeah space and orbit. So sending people is super risky because it's like, well, we haven't done it before. But the science should work as long as none of the parts fail. <laughs> but 
ideally they're just going into the upper stratosphere they're not really leaving earth's gravitational pull um they're not going into space space they're just going to like the outreaches of the atmosphere i mean there's there's uh virgin galactic launches its rocket ship from an aircraft reaching an altitude of roughly 55 miles Blue Origin launches its new Shepard rocket from the ground. Uh, the capsule gets about 66 miles. Both of these heights are considered the edge of space. By comparison, Elon Musk's SpaceX launches its capsules, both crew and cargo, into orbit around Earth. <laughs> so they make it to what technically is is space. Yes. Like the edge of space. Whereas Musk has already like put stuff into the space station and like into orbit, but it's still risky to send people up there. Like I uh, would trust Virgin more than I would trust Blue Origin, whatever Bezos is. Um, I mean, at least Branson's been working on space since two thousand and four. Yeah, that's about as long as SpaceX has been around. Mm-hmm. If you talk about like the the project for the first SpaceX rocket, it was like in Hawaii, and like the people working on it like ran out of food at one point, <laughs> the scientists, because <laughs> they were they were stuck on an island by themselves, uh, working to like they they basically had to work to get a rocket off the ground before they ran out of money, mm-hmm. and they had to do like in a like I think. Uh, I forgot. I don't know if it was a Coast Guard or somebody had to do an emergency drop of food because they literally ran out of food on the island. And uh, they couldn't get... They, they worked. I mean, they got the, the ship off the ground, proved that they could do it, and then investors continued putting money into it. But that freaking super heavy booster... So look, what looks interesting from Virgin Galactic, it looks like it's a double 747 that carries a spaceship with it. It gets up in, it takes off like a tandem parachute group, Yeah. gets to a certain altitude, then it releases the spaceship, and the spaceship just climbs vertically till it hits space. Yeah, and then it floats around there, and then they glide back home. Yep, they glide. That is a scary glide coming out of orbit. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're generating. There's a lot of heat, a lot of friction. You're traveling really fucking fast. Um. But, I I mean that's in uh, for for the type of ship that Branson is using it's more efficient to do it that way because you're not carrying a bunch of fuel. You're only carrying some fuel for the spacecraft like when it detaches from the plane. And then it can um, boost itself up. So you're not you're not wasting a bunch of fuel and weight like starting at the ground the way the rockets do it. But you can only carry so much weight that way because you're basically hanging from underneath another plane. So that mm-hmm. plane can only carry so much weight. Um, so the only problem with those is you can only get so big. So like, yeah, for what he's doing, where he wants to like transport people faster that way, like transport people up into space and back down, that's fine. But if you're transporting like cargo or what they really want to do is to create, um, what are they called? I think they're called like scramjets. So they basically go into like the upper atmosphere and like uh, kind of like you know how the uh, Concorde um, can travel like supersonic, yeah, and to cross like the Atlantic faster. This way, you go even higher and you can travel even faster, <laughs> and you can like circle the the planet in like an hour or two, versus you know being on a plane. Um, I think that's the idea of what Branson's going for is like, we'll just make these like rocket planes that shoot up really high. You can cover crazy distance 
and then just come back down. Which, if that's all you're trying to accomplish, that's fine. If you're trying to get to, like, the moon or Mars, no. that's not going to work. Well, they're doing a test run for Branson this Sunday. Yeah, and he's going to be on it. Um, so, I mean, that plane has flown before. I remember um, a few years ago, it was one of the earlier test flights of that, and, like, there was a, a catastrophic failure, and I think, I don't remember if both pilots died. I know one of them did. Because um, the plane, like, they lost control of it. And I think they were able to, like, eject out. But one of them ended up dying somehow. Like, he got hit by something. or I think it was, like, the pilot died and the co-pilot, like, lived. But he was all banged up. Um, and then they figured out that, like, at a certain speed and a certain altitude, like, certain control services didn't work right. And that's why the plane lost control. So, who knows how many how much testing they've done since then. Um, I'm sure he's confident they've done enough because he's getting on it just to beat Bezos. So, I don't know. crew with six people gone. Let's say who's going to be on it. Like, or is there like just him and other? It's him and his employees. Okay, so it's not like they sold tickets to it, right? No, but they do have seven hundred people waiting on a list that spent over two hundred thousand dollars for tickets to go into space, which is an absurd amount of money. Uh, that is. Hey, it should end better than that dude who, that flat earth guy who tried to build his own steam rocket. And then a billionaire the space race. Richard Branson announced. The flat earther who sent himself to space and then killed himself. Yeah, he was, um, uh, what's it called? Um, I don't know if he was really a flat earther. Some people say he claimed to be just to get donation money but he was a guy who used to build like his own rockets and um he would build them out of steam though which is super it's i mean it works but it's super dangerous to like pressurize steam and then get in it and then launch it off like a it was like a um it was like a railed, uh, think of like part of a roller coaster. It was like a railed machine thing that they would put the rocket on and then it would like aim it up and fire it once you release the steam out the back. That sounds sketchy. It was super sketchy. And um, the guy also had like no like formal training, I don't think, of like building these things. He just started building them in his free time i mean he i think he was like a machinist or like some sort of like uh you know guy that did work with like you know parts like big parts like that but he didn't have any like engineering or like rocketry uh background <laughs> and so he, just, uh, he what he did was he was claiming that he was building these rockets so that way he could see if the earth was truly flat or not so he was getting money from the flat earth community to build these rockets. But then some people say like, he wasn't really a flat earth person. He just said that just to get their money. So they would pay for the rocket so he could build it. Um, and then like a year ago out in like the either Arizona or California desert, like somewhere out on the border there, uh, it, the, he launched in one and there was like a catastrophic fail, failure and he died. Mm -hmm. I think it like the back of it like it blew up in mid flight or something and, and it came crashing back down. Came crashing back down. And he died. And I'm like, yeah, it's because launching rockets is really dangerous. 
Especially with steam. With steam. Um, steam in your broccoli is dangerous enough. Yeah. It's, I, I just don't know. I mean, he was no, you know, um, Von Braun, so. <laughs> People are not the smartest. No. I mean, it, I don't know. There, there are certain things that, like, work, at, but you just shouldn't do it because it's, it's dangerous and it's not controlled. So, he basically made a, a bomb. I mean, it sounds like it would have been safer to mix Mentos and Coca-Cola as your rocket. I'm sure people have tried that. Except I don't know how much you would need to make an actual... Uh, to make thrust enough to carry a person up into the air. I don't know. Some of these YouTube videos I've seen, not much. Um, oh, there's another thing. I saw an article today that scientists discovered that there's this beetle that makes uh, like a waxy lubricant for its joints and it's uh more uh i don't know what's the word like there's less friction using that than like teflon um really so it's like super like i guess the way they test it is they i mean it's really hard for them to do because they have to get these beetles and then extract like the waxy lubricant from their joints um and then they put like two panes of glass on top like within in between and then they measure how much force it takes to move them and they said it's like more uh, uh what's the opposite of of like friction um Non-friction? less friction non-friction um there's like less friction with that than there is like with teflon so now they need to figure out a way to like synthesize it because they said economically they couldn't use live beetles and extract it because it's one it's very small amounts that you would get from the beetle and it's very difficult and time consuming and it would be worth more than gold if they did it that way so what so, they need to do is have geneticists splice whatever well, create that. One of, yeah, what what they were thinking of doing is is like basically um, working with like biologists and seeing if they could get bacteria to to produce the wax, but they have to figure out exactly what the chemical compound is, like how that wax is created, because I guess the these beetles. Uh, produce the wax for like their joints to reduce friction in their in their legs so what they need to do is have geneticists get involved figure out the dna sequencing and do what they did with spiders and goats and splice a goat embryo with this so yeah. that when it produces milk it has the wacky substance in the milk and you in turn milk the goat you get the sequence, you figure out how to separate the goat milk and whatever you need. Yeah. You call it a day. You, you could, yeah, you could do it that way. Unless they can artificially produce the same chemicals in a factory, then you can make shenanigans. You can, you can make way more have, than milking goats. We have spider goats. We need beetle goats. <laughs> I heard that have they... enough for, uh, it's in Utah. It's for Kev- Kevlar style material. And it's basically everyday T-shirts that are stab-proof and resistant up to certain caliber bullets. Yeah, that's crazy. It's all about it's all about um, it's all physics. It's 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 the material. One is the material that it's made out of, the threads themselves. But it's like the way you mesh them together, you can create something that can um, absorb. Uh, it, one, they're hard to cut, and two, they absorb um, energy and dissipate it, which is what Kevlar does. Um, it just absorbs the energy. 
I mean, getting Between... shot with a Kevlar vest still, I heard he's like getting hit with a baseball bat, but yeah. or worse, uh, depending on the caliber. But at least it's not gonna like kill you. It's just gonna cause severe he's bruising. Injured. Which is scary, because that's what they're telling us now. Think about what's already in production and what they're not telling us. Oh, yeah, there's some crazy stuff out there that different governments have already built and are working on. I mean, what, like, the first stealth fighter, they people didn't know about it till the early 90s, but it had been in development since, like, the late 70s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, it's like, there's there's stuff that exists that we don't know about. Or even the B-2 bombers that were so prevalent. And then, like, 2008, 2010, they had the whole documentary about them. I'm like, well, if you're showing us everything about it, and they're retired now, what the hell do we have already in sequence? Yeah. You know, there's already, they're already building the replacement for the B-2 and the B-1. Um, That's supposed to be even more stealthy and probably carry more bombs and go further. Uh, but if you look at the design of like the B2, there is, there's like an old like Nazi design of a bomber that they uh, mm-hmm. made that is similar to that. Like they figured it out freaking 70 years ago. Mm, they have a new tank coming out. That's going to replace the uh, M1 series Abrams. Did they already? Like us. Did they name it yet? They named it. I don't know what the name of it is because he's working on it right now. But it's basically got double the barrel length on it. Dang! So I was like, "What are they doing?" He goes, "Oh, you know what they're doing." I'm like, "Uh huh." That thing's gonna go stupid distances. Uh. Well, according to this, I mean, there's some. The M one two four A three or whatever the hell it's called. Yeah, they they talk about that it's due to be replaced by future combat systems XM one two zero two, but due to, but due to its cancellation, the military opted to continue maintaining the M one for the seeable future, upgrading its optics, armor, and firepower. That's according to Wikipedia. I mean, the M one's been around since nineteen eighty, so it's forty years old. And just keep enhancing, and they just enhancing. they do keep upgrading it. Um, but they are probably working on something else. It just comes down to like, um, it, it just comes down to like cost and whether or not it's worth making a bunch of them. I remember a few years ago, um, there was a big issue with Congress because. The army told Congress, like, hey, yeah, um, we know that you're doing our like defense budget, but we don't need more tanks because we have more tanks than we have tank crews. And Congress is like, yeah, but those factories are going to – if they're not producing tank parts and tanks, then those people are going to lose jobs. So we'll buy more tanks. So mm-hmm. they bought more tanks. And now they just sit in a graveyard somewhere. Mm-hmm. In the middle of America. But heaven forbid we should keep everyday businesses open. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Dude, I saw Thanks, another... America. I saw another thing, this this kid in, uh, in this, like, scientist, this guy. I mean, he, he looked young, but he, I guess he works at some university in the UK. He created a device that you plug stab wounds with. So, it's like, uh... It's like a tampon, kind of, but it's like it's like a long it's like a long. I guess it's maybe like a fabricy kind of, or it's like it's called like a balloon, and it's got like this, like a solid piece on top, and you stick it in the stab wound, and then you get a thing that looks kind of like a drill gun, but it's got like a special end on it, and you select what part of the body it's on. And then you attach it to the top of the the uh, the device, and it inflates it, and it plugs the stab wound and applies pressure on the inside. Uh, so instead of just putting gauze on top and then putting pressure, it actually goes inside and then applies it inflates and applies pressure, and then you can slowly deflate it 
while the blood is clotted because in the article it was saying that what causes a lot of extra bleeding is that you you put pressure on the wound you put gauze the blood starts to clot but then when you pull it off it like it, pulls the again. clots apart and starts bleeding again so this way you can slowly decrease the pressure without disrupting the clotting as much that's weird <laughs> And I'm like, that's that's fascinating. <laughs> Doesn't sound right, but uh Hey, if it's gonna keep you alive from a stab wound, then I think he just needs to make the device like the stuff smaller. I'm just yeah, I'm trying to figure out like a stab wound's gonna be pretty thin, so like wouldn't you be doing more damage by trying to like put something I don't know. I mean, they have those things that you, for bullet wounds, that are kind of like tampons. They're like these spongy yeah. things that you stuff in a bullet wound. But, I don't know, it didn't look, it didn't look, uh, I mean, he had like a, it on a, like a, a practice like dummy. Like one of those CPR dummies that people use. Those like torsos, and he had it on one of those. I'm like, that's kind of cool. I don't trust that at all. I mean, I'm not looking forward to getting stabbed, but... I'm just going to pull that knife out and stab somebody back. <laughs> um, he said he he in, came up with it because uh, he's had f- numerous friends that have been stabbed. <laughs> Maybe he needs some new friends. <laughs> um, well, like, stabbings are a bigger thing in, like, the UK because they don't have guns. So they just stab each other. <laughs> so I don't know. Is it better? I don't know. We don't. We don't have uh, Dink on here with his rhino to dispute it. <laughs> this fifty cal handgun. I give up with that kid. It's just. This is overkill. It's just overkill. Um. Oh. Uh, the buddy that I was talking to at work who works on the tanks, he's got a 50 cal sniper too, and he just had it rebalanced and remodded. He said the recoil hits like a 22 on it. And I guess he changed out the baffle, the suppressor. I mean, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of things you could do to it, but... But he said the kick at, at most is a... Uh. And I was like, what? Excuse me? I mean, yeah, if you're able to mod it and dissipate the energy, yeah. But he's also the guy that was he was in Bosnia a couple times. Like he kept going back there. He's got all sorts of tricks of the trade. I'm like, I don't wanna know. I don't need to know. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there's friends at the end of the day. I'm sure there's non stock things you could do to it. I just I just wonder though, because like a fifty caliber round has just a lot of energy in it. So it's like I don't know. Maybe to him it feels like a twenty (laughs) two. But to Uh, the 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 uninitiated it's it's like getting hit by a truck. (laughs) I mean, who knows? His fist is probably about as hard as your table or your desk right there. Yeah. So to him, it's like a 22, but he's oh, used to nothing. it. Like throwing a Nerf football around. Yeah. I got more kickback than my super soaker in third grade. Um. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I mean, I'd like to fire a 50 at some point. Um, I wouldn't. The most, the biggest I've ever fired was like a handgun of 44. No, it was a 357. Whatever we shot at uh, Embraer. Yeah, I think it was a 357, right? I know for sure we shot the 357. Yeah, it was a 357. I don't think we I don't think they had a 44 Magnum. Um but yeah, 357 which has some kick on it. It's not like uncontrollable, but I imagine a 50 in a pistol is a lot more than that. Um, and I'm sure the gun itself is going to be heavier than that. Just to, just the mass to contain the explosion. Um, but I would like to fire like a Barrett or something. That'd be cool. I know in Vegas we could do that. 
Mm-hmm. You can also shoot a chain gun, too. Yeah. Here's a turret. Go have fun with that. <laughs> uh, it's just like, I don't know. I think that'd be fun to do it once, but I feel like it's just a huge waste of ammunition. <laughs> Unnecessarily. Because <laughs> it fires, what, like 6,000 rounds a minute or something? Mm-hmm. So it's like one second. It's like 100 rounds. <laughs> I've fired more in two seconds than I did my entire life. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe next time we go visit Dink, he'll have a minigun by then. Or an A-10 Warthog. Yeah, he'll just have one at his parents. Just hanging out. He's like, oh yeah, it was it was army it was army surplus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spot. Right next to the horses. Just let me have it. Um, dude, they were gonna retire those things, and then they're like, nah. Nah, this is too much fun. Nah, we're just gonna keep them. <laughs> nah, playing go. Um, I think they were gonna replace them because of the F thirty five, but that still hasn't worked out. So they're like, nah, we're just gonna keep them. Like, are we shooting Russian yeah. tanks on the open battlefield of Eastern Europe? No. But they're good for other stuff. <laughs> and if we ever need to, yeah, we have we the have ammunition to. that will just turn a tank into paper. So here you go. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the Russians have updated their tanks in a long time. So it should still work. Even if they have, there's always a weak spot. Actually, I saw a thing that the Russians were developing a new tank where they, um, it's like slightly smaller than their older ones. And I think there's one less crew member. There's no loader. It has like automatic loading. But I also, uh, whatever show it was, I also saw that like the automatic loaders are actually slower than a guy doing it. I believe that. So, like, uh, you know, a U.S. tanker in a Abrams is faster at reloading an Abrams than, like, one of those automated guns are. Which is strange, because it should be, like, super quick, but, I don't know, for some reason it's slower. So, gives the guy a job, right? <laughs> Well, the one thing they never account for, they account for other weapons and firepower. They never account for Mother Nature because it seems like no matter how high-tech things are, you just throw some wind and some sand around and they're like, uh, I can't see anything. And then there's a pothole and the tank track can't get over the pothole and then some water gets in and it's just over. Yeah. I mean, current tanks are using, you know, jet engines. So I heard they had a lot of they had a lot of fun in Iraq in the 90s when they realized that like jet engines don't like sand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, well, they just left everything there. Driving driving a tank through the desert isn't great for the tank. <laughs> it's so hot on the inside too. It's hot and mm-hmm. like the in- no intake the intake doesn't like sand. It likes air. Um yeah, I heard it's just not great living in a tank. I mean, survivability in one is is fantastic, but they can take multiple RPG hits, but it's still not fun. <laughs> oh man, oh, yeah. could, you, could you imagine being a tanker like in World War II? How crappy that would have been. With uh, Rumsfeld. No, like World War II, like in an old Sherman tank, or like. A tiger, yeah. a Nazi tiger tank or whatever. Like, could you imagine how shitty that would have been? Would have been just, fun just... hanging out with Patton as he's yelling at you. We need a guy out here. Steal gas from the other units. I don't care. <laughs> We're gonna head him head on. I mean, yeah, was that that Rom- been... was it. Romfield was what was the who was the German tank commander? His Rommel? counterpart, Rommel. Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. Mm-hmm. Who was basically Only... given the option to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Uh, to not be publicly embarrassed. For not agreeing with Hitler. Yeah. 
I mean, the guy was smart. He wasn't an idiot. He was a career soldier. Um, I so. think it's wild. You have two old guys chasing each other in these iron war horses, terrorizing everything. Yeah, I mean, they they had it better than... Like, if you look at the Battle of um, Zabal Kirks uh, in, like, Eastern Europe, where basically the German armor armor was, like, kind of destroyed after that because they went up against a bunch of Russian, like, T-34s and stuff <laughs> in open fields. Um, it's, it's like, it, it wasn't great. <laughs> Like it was, you're in these little. I mean, World War One was probably worse because the machines tried to kill you themselves. I mean, they had yeah. the engine inside the cabin with the driver and the gunner and the the tank commander and stuff, and like they're just inhaling engine fumes. All the exhaust. All the exhaust. Like that was worse. Um, and the things traveled about two miles an hour. So. And then factor in all the the fire that can get inside. So, Hey, let me just throw this Molotov cocktail and yeah. mobilize this tank. It was great against like small arms, but the things were held together with rivets. They're basically boats on land and they handled like it too. So world war one tankers were, I mean, a lot of them died just cause the tank would like poison them to death. <laughs> they die from carbon monoxide. Um, or they would get stuck, and then the enemy would come up and kill them. Mm -hmm. uh, but World War Two wasn't a whole lot better. I mean, it was like they... You got to think of, like, the guys who had to travel hundreds of miles inside of a tank. Like, especially in the desert, too. Like, you think of, like, North Africa. There's um, no air conditioning in those tanks. No. They didn't have air conditioning back then. Cars didn't have air conditioning back then. So... Being in a tank with, you know, four other guys for hundreds of miles with no bathrooms. It must have stank horrible in there. You didn't change your clothes. You didn't shower. If you're in combat, all you guys are sweating and adrenaline pouring out of your pores. It must really stink. Also, you probably went deaf. Because, you know. What? Huh? Exactly. So, I don't know. That would have Good been times. a sight. Siri, still one of my favorite movies. Yeah, it reminds me. I need to watch that again. The The sound design of that movie is amazing. That's probably my favorite part. It's just the fact that it sounds so, like, visceral. Hearing, like, the tank shells whiz past and the explosions vibrating and stuff. It, it actually, that movie sounds really good. Anyways. Uh, uh, on that note, looks like we're hitting our hour mark, give or take. Yeah. Hour and eight minutes. Sounds good to me. Well, I think it's a good uh, place as any to call it. Unfortunately, nobody else was able to join us this week. We have lame friends. I know. If you mm -hmm. want to be on the podcast, mm -hmm. just send us a message. Yeah. We'll put or anyone on. I'll just start. I'll start asking people because <laughs> obviously everyone's like, "This is a great idea," but I'm never going to show up. I'm too tired to get on today. I'm too busy playing soccer. Oh, I'm <laughs> busy being a house husband. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm not going to get on because I don't have a webcam. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just not going to answer questions after I said I wanted to be in your podcast. Not calling anyone out on that one. No, definitely Brit. not. Not Brit at all. No. And they they can they can know who we're talking about if they watch this episode, as you should watch this episode, as you are watching this episode. And if you could tell someone about it and like and subscribe, that would really help us out because it would make making this worth it. Except the government's going to shut it down. Except the government's going to shut us down at some point. So watch Another it while you can. Word, government high five. Peace out. See ya, everybody.